I want to. I want to just. You know, last night we talked about overshadowing, and today I want to talk about overflow for just a moment. Um, because there is a difference between a river and a reservoir. Okay, and you have both. Do you know that you have both? You are both a a cup, a vessel, a container, like a reservoir, and you are also a river. That there are rivers of living water flowing from your Amen. animal speed. Amen. Um, you need to learn how to flow in both of those. How to... The reservoir has to do with how you receive. Okay? Because reservoir is about containing. It's about holding. It's about um, storing. And how many know that you want to retain the things that God pours into you, right? And so there is an aspect of your character and your nature that's a reservoir. And then there's the aspect of your character and nature that's a river. Uh, like it says, of course, in John 7, 38, that he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers, plural, of living water. And we could go into that whole thing about multiple rivers that flow from your innermost being. Did you know that in the Garden of Eden there were four rivers that flowed uh, through the Garden of Eden? And each one, one, the name actually means fruitfulness. One, the name means prosperity. One, the name means acceleration. And one, the name would indicate breakthrough, actually. And so the rivers that flowed through the Garden of Eden were rivers of prosperity, rivers of acceleration, rivers of, of um, breakthrough, and, uh, and so that's good stuff, huh? So out of your innermost being flows rivers of living water. And our goal is to receive what the Lord has. You guys are easy receivers, so we're not going to talk about that. Uh, so that's the reservoir side of who you are, is just yielding to what God is doing and let it saturate you. You know, the goal is that saturation would produce marination, that would produce transformation. All right? The, the, that's more than just a clever little phrase, but you're supposed to get saturated... All right? But the purpose of saturation is marination. And what do I mean by marination? Marination changes the nature of your being. See, the scripture says that now in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 3, it says, His divine power has already given you everything you need pertaining to life and godliness through your knowledge of Him. It says, through these, he has given you his very great and, great and precious promises and made you partakers of the divine nature so that you could escape the corruption that's in the world caused by its evil desires. You're never corrupted by your desires. You're corrupted by its desires because you don't, you don't have them anymore. But, uh, but anyway, it says you're partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature is... The marination that results in tra transformation. All right? So when I'm receiving of the Lord, my goal is to get totally full of what God is doing. To yield all of myself to all of what the Lord is doing in that moment. That's saturation. Wow. All right? Th this is one of the reasons that uh, we have healing rooms at our place is because... Uh, the principle of healing rooms is actually not based upon a one-moment encounter. It's actually based upon the buildup of glory with that person. See, every time you pray for somebody, something happens. It's just not always uh, evident in the material realm, in the physical realm. But every time you pray, something happens. Every single time you pray. But, and so oftentimes, a measure of breakthrough is released. When you do that, but you don't necessarily see what happened. And so many people believe, ah, oh, nothing happened. Um, and so I need to go pray some more, fast some more, study some more, which none of that's bad. That's all good. But that, those should all be your delight, not your duty, right? That's right. And, and you don't earn brownie points in heaven, and you're not big enough to twist God's arm. And a, Amen. And a, a fast that's not based on intimacy is just a bad diet, really. I mean, if you're, 
it's if you're hunger striking God with those facts. Like, I'm not gonna eat till you speak to me. Hey, let's see who wins that one. That would be great. You go, Gandhi. Ah. That's not a fast, that's a hunger strike. It's a sign of immaturity, of not really understanding that fast is setting yourself apart to the voice of the Lord for a time of intimate communion where there's no interferences at all. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a romantic getaway between you and God where nothing can interfere with His voice and His face. You know what I'm saying? So, I have no idea why I'm talking about that, but it's good. Uh, but saturation, that's what we were talking about, is that every time we pray for somebody, something happens. And then the reason we have healing rooms is because there's a buildup of the glory. Buildup of the glory. Buildup of the glory. Till they are so filled with the, with the tangible glory of God, the revelation of the glory of God within them, that sickness just can't stay. Uh, that no, no kind of oppression or anything can stay within them. So it's all about saturation. It's all, all about having every fiber of your being saturated with the divine nature. Every, every single cell just absolutely vibrating with the voice of heaven. That's, that's the goal. That's why we yield ourselves to God. It's interesting, though, how come sometimes people get really hit by God, but when they get up, they're not different? Uh, that's because the, saturate, the purpose of saturation is marination. See, you're supposed to stay under the influence. Come on now. You're supposed to stay under the influence. Some people want to touch. You know, some people just want the moment. They want the event. They want the thrill. There's nothing wrong with that, but the goal is not just to get a touch. The goal is to yield yourself to the divine nature to continue to just transform and change you. See, uh, you've all heard before that the word baptism actually wasn't originally in the Bible. It, it was originally in a Greek pickling recipe 400 years before it appeared in the Bible. Baptizo. Yeah, baptizo, exactly. Baptizo, so it appeared... Again, 400 years before it was ever used in the Bible. And in that, it talks about how you take a, a cucumber and you put it in the brine solution. And, and here's the beautiful thing about baptizo. Baptizo doesn't mean to dip, you know. Uh, like, I was brought up Presbyterian, so I was sprinkled. <laughs> you know what I mean? So later on, I went ahead and got dumped because they told me if you haven't been dumped, you're flunked. You know what I'm saying? So, so I was dumped, you know? But actually, the word baptism doesn't even mean to dip. It means to sink a ship. Baptism doesn't just mean whoo. We're, dip, we're, we're dipping the Easter egg and it comes up red on the outside now. You know what I mean? No, no, no. Baptizo means to sink a ship in the glory, to sink a ship in the divine nature until saturation brings about a marination. See, you're, you're actually to soak in that divine nature till you just literally are pickled. Until you're not a cucumber anymore. Like, you can change a cucumber to a pickle, but you can never change a pickle back into a cucumber. See, you, through marination, your nature is so deified in a way that you can never go back. You can never go back. You've just been so transformed, so changed. So saturation, marination brings transformation. And that's, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the transformed lifestyle. We're looking for the resurrected lifestyle. We're looking for the ascended lifestyle. Listen, don't even stop at the finished work of the cross because the goal of the cross was the resurrected man, was the ascended lifestyle. And you know, for 20 some years of ministry, I lived Christianity like life insurance, like, like it was a payoff when you die. So, hey, just suffer through it, pay your premiums, and when you die, there'll be the payoff. You know what I'm saying? Well, great. So you live to die. You just hold on till Jesus comes or you die or whatever. And most people have life insurance. 
But what we have is not life insurance. What we have is inheritance. Life insurance pays off when you die. Inheritance pays off when somebody else dies. <laughs> I like that one better. <laughs> when Jesus Christ died, you got his inheritance. Everything that was his is now yours. And you didn't do anything to receive it but be related to him. That's, that's the only thing. Since I'm related to Jesus, I get his inheritance. So here's the deal. Most people stop at the cross. They think it's a stop sign. They, most, most people come into the door of the kingdom through repentance and never step inside. They spend their whole earthly life standing in the doorway of Christ. Not knowing that the whole purpose of his sacrifice was to get you into the kingdom and the kingdom into you. That, that was the whole goal. It was not life insurance. It was inheritance. An inheritance. So actually, eternity doesn't begin the moment you die. It begins the moment you believe. That's right. Eternity's already started. You know, your physical death is, is going to be, I mean, if Jesus doesn't uh, come before then, your physical death is going to be so short and so quick, you're, you're not even going to recognize it as an event. It's just the immediate translation from one state to another, from one glory to a greater glory. That just doesn't sound so bad to me. So, anyway, the goal is to live this ascended lifestyle, this resurrected lifestyle now. Here's the deal. Most Christians have a present tense relationship with sin and a future tense relationship with resurrection. So they have a present tense relationship to sin. Like, I'm struggling with sin. Sin's... You know, uh, my sinful nature and all this kind of stuff. And most churches preach that. that I'm, not, I'm not against churches. <laughs> I love them. I love my brothers and sisters all around the world and every expression and every flavor of church. So please, this is not an anti-church statement because I was a part of this message for decades of ministry. But most people think the message is actually sin. And that the method of the church is sin management. Let's teach you how to manage your sin while you walk the earth here. And we have a greater sin consciousness than God consciousness. We're more aware of sin than we are of the presence of God. Because the message is sin. And whatever you focus on, you will create that same atmosphere around you. And so we create an atmosphere that actually empowers and expects failure. Because we have a present tense relationship with sin. And a future tense relationship with the resurrection. Ah, oh, but one day, won't that be glory? When we take off these old earth suits and we put on the heavenly. And you know what? It will be. But the thing is, the scripture puts the believer in a past tense relationship with sin. It puts you in a past tense relationship with sin. He goes, when you were in your sinful nature. Remember that? Remember back then? Remember when you were that? You actually have a past tense relationship with sin and a present tense relationship with resurrection. You have been made alive with Christ Jesus. You have been made alive with Christ Jesus. So you know what? There's this whole anachronistic crunch uh, anachronistic is something out of its proper time or place. Like right now, if we looked out on the street and a horse and buggy, buggy was going by and people were all dressed like pilgrims, you know, and they were riding by, we'd go, what's going on here? That's how weird a present tense relationship with sin is. It doesn't fit. It's not in your time zone, man. It's, it's not in... It's not in this system of life that you're supposed to have. And then that future tense relationship with resurrection. Ah, oh, one day. Oh, ah. Oh. Yeah, one day is going to be glorious. I don't ever want to take away from the glory of the physical resurrection. All I'm trying to do is introduce people into the glory of the current resurrection. Amen. That you've already been raised up together with Christ Jesus. Amen. 